Sinoe and Cleopatra, Hollywood. Historians are wrong there, with the appearance of the two. What happens is that it is assumed they must reflect the ethnicity of the area, but as other historians know, the royal lines of Egypt come from island and of planet. It was the year 46 or 47 BC. Roman forces under Julius Caesar had taken almost the entire eastern Mediterranean coastal area. Only Egypt remained as a sovereign country, and it was in negotiations for its surrender, although there were still places or positions within Egypt that resisted the Roman invasion. There were two positions among the circles of power in Egypt. One position was one of full cooperation with Rome, with or by promises to maintain its power, Cleopatra's side. The other was that of resistance to the invader and of organizing the people to fight against Rome, Arsinoe's side. Human history says they were sisters. Brothers, Ptolemy 13, Ptolemy 14. Sisters Arsinoe 4, Berenice 4 of Egypt, according to the official story. When the king, wrongly called Pharaoh, died, Ptolemy 12 left the kingdom to his eldest son, Ptolemy 13. And as he was only a boy of about 11 years of age, he also in equal parts left power to his eldest daughter Cleopatra, who was 18 years old. As was the custom, they were both married. But Ptolemy XIII agreed with the position of his sister Arsinoe, of non-cooperation with the Romans, on the grounds that this was the general will of the Egyptian people. Cleopatra disagreed, and as she was older than Ptolemy XIII, she was the one who was really in power. By this time, the Romans already had a base on the outskirts of Alexandria. And, as they were preparing for a major invasion, they were in large numbers and under the command of Julius Caesar himself. In itself, Ptolemy and Cleopatra ended up fighting, and Arsinoe and Ptolemy XIII expelled her from Egypt to the Lower Nile with her guards. This was a serious mistake because soon after, only a few weeks, Cleopatra returned to infiltrate the royal palace again. When Cleopatra left, negotiations had begun with Julius Caesar on behalf of Ptolemy XIII and Arsinoe. Julius Caesar stayed as a guest at the royal palace. Infiltration of Cleopatra in the royal palace, according to the Roman historian Plutarch. Cleopatra entered Alexandria in a small rowboat and landed right next to the palace just after dark, and because of her small size, she was able to enter it without being detected. She wrapped herself in a thick blanket tied with thick rope, and her accomplices carried her into Caesar's rooms. Then, inside the room with Caesar, she came out of her wrappings and entered Julio's bed, ready to reveal herself to him just at the moment that would have the greatest impact. 
This indicates the will of Cleopatra, who was capable of doing anything to achieve her goals. Caesar was 52 years old, she only 22. Plutarch. This in itself is considered a calculated act of high treason to her royal family and Egypt. She messed up her hair, tore her clothes, and changed up her makeup to look like she had been crying. A theater scene to manipulate Julius Caesar. But it was all calculated. She hadn't cried a single tear. And with this appearance, she asked him, Oh, mighty Caesar, I have been deprived of my birthright as queen of Egypt, and I will live in exile for all eternity unless you, O oh Caesar, give me back my destiny that is mine by birth, and therefore I, a queen, beg you, and I put myself at your feet. Cleopatra spent the entire night with Caesar. But the next morning, Ptolemy XIII himself found her and saw her there with him. And the child, who was already in charge and knew how to be, threw away his diadem and ran off screaming that Cleopatra had betrayed him and that with it she had stabbed all Egypt in the back. With that, Ptolemy XIII summoned his army, Julius Caesar his, and a great and bloody battle began. Caesar's forces stormed the palace and took Arsinoe and Ptolemy XIII hostage. Caesar himself had Ptolemy XIII by the arm, he was only a child, he dragged him out. Meanwhile in the port, the Roman soldiers attacked and set fire to the Egyptian ships. And with it, the rest of the city of Alexandria was also burned. So the Egyptian soldiers stopped fighting the Romans to try to put an end to the flames and save the city. The Roman forces then went to take the great lighthouse of Alexandria, Pharos, because whoever controlled the island where it was controlled all the maritime traffic that entered and left the port of Alexandria. They took control of the great 100 meter high lighthouse, one of the so-called wonders of the ancient world and the royal emblem of the Cleopatra family. Arsinoe managed to escape from Romans, and jumping out of a window into the Nile, she swam far from them, and she immediately managed to contact the Egyptian leaders or generals who were doing their best to confront the Roman legions and at the same time save the city from the flames. At this time, the generals and the people against Rome, that same night, proclaimed Arsinoe as their queen, as the one who would lead and guide them against Rome. At this moment, the Romans had placed their base of operations on the island of Pharos and they were under false confidence in their military ability and seriously underestimated the military capabilities of the Egyptians. A counter-attack was organized, and it was devastating because the Romans were basically trapped there. Julius Caesar himself had to swim out to save his life, to one of his closest boats. The great Julius Caesar had been defeated by Arsinoe, who was only 16 years old.
but that didn't last long. During the brawl, the young Ptolemy XIII tried to escape from the Romans by swimming, but loaded with his royal gold ornaments, he could not float and drowned in the attempt. Cleopatra has succeeded in defeating her first rival for the throne of Egypt without having to do anything. At that time, she was already in one of the Roman warships together with Julius Caesar. A few days later, Caesar brought reinforcements from Syria, Roman combat and elite legions. They counterattacked the royal palace in Alexandria and took control. But the Romans did not invade Egypt. They gave it to Cleopatra, proclaiming her undisputed queen. And by tradition, she should marry her young brother Ptolemy XIV, who was just a little boy. They arrested Arsinoe, and she was put in a dungeon in the same palace with two guards. Julius Caesar gave instructions for her to be taken to Rome as soon as possible. Cleopatra claimed that she was the reincarnation of the goddess Ishtar and used this to gain the respect of the Egyptian people. But also, and at the same time, Arsinoe claimed to be the reincarnation of Ishtar herself, causing confusion and skepticism in the Egyptians on both sides. But since it was Cleopatra who was in power, they began to see her as Ishtar. This is where the concept of the black Ishtar and the white Ishtar is born. Using a trick of the time, at night servants loyal to Arsinoe managed to reach the small dungeon window from the outside, and they poured acid on the bases of the bars. Using a bar, they managed to break some and bend others, enough for Arsinoe, who was small in size and thin, to pass through the small hole which had been previously cleaned of the acid using Nile water and some close blankets. From there, they moved her to a small rowboat, and in the darkness of night, they crossed the Nile to a small waiting caravan. Caravan with cart, supplied by their resistance against the Romans. From there, hidden and dressed as a peasant, Arsinoe was taken to Palestine to the small town of Magdala, on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. In Magdala, she was contacted by members of the resistance against the Roman occupation. Many already knew that Arsinoe had escaped from the Romans a few weeks earlier. Knowing who she was, she soon began to give her advice and instigate the Palestinian and Jewish leaders and give them ideas on how to fight the Romans. Becoming a military strategist against the Romans and introducing concepts of guerrilla and asymmetric combat. At the same time, and as it was her nature, she began to give her teachings about consciousness and how the universe worked, how to treat people. And little by little, she gained popularity in the area even without wanting to. 
However, in order to be heard before a certain class of people en masse, she couldn't do it as a woman, so she used a close friend who had come to look for her only a few weeks before. He is known by the name of Asa Sel. She gave him her teachings and he shared them as his because they would listen to him for being a man. They went on like this for about two years, more or less in peace, always dodging the Roman legions and their investigations against the rebels and their leaders. But the point was reached where it was already clear who and from whom the guerrilla orders and instructions against the occupation forces were coming. And there was also someone who betrayed and told the Romans that Arsinoe was hiding in the area of Galilee. They had Arsinoe arrested. But again, she was helped to escape by sea, leaving the port that now is called Haifa by boat. She began her withdrawal from Palestine with the intention of reaching Ireland and Scotland to be under the protection of the Druids and the Celts and their resistance against the Romans. Asasel stayed behind to cover the retreat, with the intention of also escaping on another ship. But he had also been accused of the same, of mass instigation. He was arrested and hung from a tree. Arsinoe continued by boat until she reached the island of Malta where they docked for supplies and where she was informed that the Romans had encircled the Strait of Gibraltar to prevent their escape since Cleopatra knew of their intentions to reach Ireland, Scotland. So in Malta a new plan was thought which was to reach the southern coast of France and with the help of the Gauls and the French resistance against Rome to cross France by land and reach the English Channel, where they would embark from again to Great Britain and from there to Scotland and Ireland. Two and a half weeks later, the small ship reached the coast of France, just south of Montpellier from where it contacted the French resistance and they agreed to help her cross France by land. But shortly after, in the Carcassonne area, France, they were intercepted and followed by a Roman patrol. It is very possible that they knew it was Arsinoe, given the amount of resources the Romans used to try to arrest her. So she and her group were forced to move south and seek refuge in the area of the Cathars mountains of France, where she remained for the duration of almost a year, at the end of which she began again her journey to cross France. Only a few days later, in the area where the Mont Segur castle is today, they were stopped by Roman cavalry and Arsinoe was arrested, chained, and in the following days taken in a cage to the city of Rome, where Julius Caesar received her as a war trophy. Julius Caesar condemned her to die in the Colosseum to be devoured by wild beasts. She was locked in the Colosseum itself while they were preparing the big event. They built a huge replica of the lighthouse of Alexandria, which was perceived 
as the emblem of the royal family of Egypt, and of Arsinoe in particular, given the victory against Rome a few years before that. They would burn down the great lighthouse while Arsinoe was to be eaten by the beasts below. And publicity was spread all over Rome of the great event, and that the great Julius Caesar had in his power the Egyptian princess queen, the same one who dared to insult him and the great Rome. On the day of the event, the Colosseum, which is not the same today, but an early one since the famous one was built by the Flavians, there were several Colosseums, as is well known. The Colosseum was completely filled with great crowds of people for the big party. They fixed Arsinoe's hair and made her like an Egyptian queen, stripped her naked and unchained her, and she was put in a large cage on an ornate horse-drawn carriage. As was customary, part of the show was watching the victim run for her life. The horse-drawn cart, escorted by trumpets, came out onto the arena and continued to circle the arena for all to see the queen getting humiliated. In the center was the great replica of the lighthouse of Alexandria. The audience was against the sacrifice of the Egyptian queen. They booed Caesar and asked him to spare her life. In the crowd, there was a man of political position named Claudius Vespus, close to Caesar, and he told him that he wanted Arsinoe as a personal slave and offered Caesar a bag of gold as payment for Arsinoe. Caesar just laughed at the idea of Claudius Vespus and told him that he didn't need more gold, but that he could have the Egyptian if he wanted. This is how the cart with the cage and Arsinoe inside exited the arena of the Colosseum, and Arsinoe was taken to the private villa of Claudius Vespus. At the villa, Claudius Vespus treated Arsinoe reasonably well at first, giving her a large room to herself and all the comforts of the place. But as expected, he wanted to use Arsinoe as a personal slave for his sexual entertainment. However, despite his civilized attempts to get close to her, Arsinoe refused to make herself available to him. After only about two or three weeks, they had an argument, during which Vesus ordered Arsinoe to sleep with him, and not only once, but for what she was, a sex slave. She continued to refuse, and Vespus ordered that she be handed over to him for the guard's entertainment, and then whipped. She was taken to the guard's village, where she was repeatedly raped, and at dawn they whipped her until her back bled. Under Caesar's decree through Claudius Vespus, Arsinoe was ordered to exile to the provinces, to the Roman city of Ephesus, or Ephesus, which at that time was about 10 times bigger than Pompeii, where she would be safeguarded from the Roman forces. She was forced to live under observation in the temple of Ephesus, in the care of its priests, without being able to leave. Turkey. There, Arsinoe spent about two or three months at the most until Cleopatra found out that her sister was still alive 
which was a danger for her if she returned, and because she knew she was a mass instigator. Using her lover, Marco Antonio, who ordered the Roman forces to go to the temple and kill her. One night, eight Roman soldiers entered the temple, dragged her out of her bed by her hair, carried her to the center of the temple, held her down, and killed her with their swords. There she was, buried in a small tomb, shaped like a lighthouse, the octagon tomb, or eight-sided, like the very structure of the lighthouse of Alexandria. Mary's name, equivalent to Virgo, as in Virgin Mary, as based on Ishtar, and Magdalene, because she wanted to make herself pass as from the city of Magdala. Mary Magdalene, the one that was close to Jesus, a prostitute from what I remember. How do you know again that she is related to Arsinoe? Mary Magdalene, the one they say was a prostitute, typical of the cabal to always use those things to muddy people, was Arsinoe herself. It is also said that she was the wife of Jesus. It's just that Jesus got related with Azazel. Mary Magdalene was passing him information, but that is already an alteration or deformation of historical events. Okay, have you found some of Mary Magdalene's Arsinoe's teachings reflected in the official teachings of Jesus? It is difficult to say. It would be necessary to examine that more carefully. It's just that what can be called his teachings are not only his, that is, they are part of a block of knowledge that is very old. Another point that is very important to emphasize and make very clear. Leaving aside the non-linear characteristic of time, being linear only from the point of view of the progressive perception of an individual's life experience, these events do not entirely coincide, for the most part they do, with what they describe in scriptures. This is because Josephus and his scribes modified all the dates to artificially coincide within their agendas and their writings. The story of Jesus is nothing more than an astrological compilation mixed with local paganism, such as Osiris Ishtar, Judaic paganism, such as Akhenaten Moses, Gnostic paganism focused on ancient Proto-Judaism, and a mixture of modified anecdotes from Titus's military campaigns. His teachings are almost entirely Roman Stoicism, promoted precisely by the Flavians Vespasio and Titus. This is very evident throughout the pro-Roman approach to Jesus. Not only with their giving to Caesar what is Caesar's, but also in several biblical passages, Jesus tells his followers that they must pay their taxes to Rome. This is very damning, because it turns out 
that the failure to pay taxes on behalf of the people of Galilee and the Palestinian rebels and the entire area was precisely what they refused. Almost nothing of Jesus, if anything out there is found, is really unique to him as it is attributed to Jesus as authorship. Mary, which is equivalent to Ishtar as a name, Magdalene, was a mass agitator with a goal to promote civil disobedience. And she worked through Azazel many times, not always. Now, today, in the new age, the same thing is still promoted. That spiritually advanced beings don't fight, they just turn the other cheek. This is Roman Stoicism, today reflected in the New Age. New Age people not defending themselves is more Roman Stoicism and it is what the Cabal wants. To reuse those formulas to calm and control the masses, especially the so-called awake. Dor Karel's example of this. Here on the ship, there are several cats with various personalities. There is Moon, that is a kitten that is very affectionate and is all love. It does not defend itself from any attack. She only screams for help when disturbed, and therefore everyone else is teasing her just for fun. Then there is the other extreme, La Cali, Teresa, who is the alpha cat here. She gets angry and hits all the other cats, and therefore no one comes close to her. But she lives in constant anger. And then we have Ari, a very calm cat. He does not mess with anyone. But if they bother him, he defends himself. And he lives in peace. He is happy and calm. A bit of everything. Not be like Kali, Teresa, nor like Moon. Be like Ari. Returning to Arsinoe, Mary Magdalene, clearly part of what she and Azazel lived was used as part of the story by Josephus and his scribes precisely with the objective to smear and lessen the subversive influence of Arsinoe Mary Magdalene. That's why they paint her as a prostitute, because she caused the Romans many problems as one of the leaders of the resistance in the Palestinian area. It was all used as part of the story at Roman convenience. Also, with a goal to discredit Arsinoe, who was the only woman to defeat Julius Caesar militarily. They erased her from history. Both Cleopatra and Arsinoe insisted on being Ishtar, to gain the loyalty of the Egyptians. And from there, two were created, the white and the black one. They adopted Cleopatra as a symbol and as an icon, like Ishtar, the one that the Cabal worships, to whom they make temples like the one at Notre Dame, because she gave them Egypt, which the Cabal wanted for a long time, from the time of Nefertiti and Akhenaten. That is why there is a white Ishtar and a black Ishtar. Cleopatra is only taken as positive because the Cabal turns everything around, as what happens with Enki and Enlil. Cleopatra is the good one because she served them. She gave them Egypt. Arsinoa is the bad one because she fought against them. As I have already told you, we here, or I in this case, 
represent the side of Enlil, that they always represent as the bad one, and Enki as the good one, and they relate Enki to Akhenaten Moses and then as Jesus. Everything is upside down. And remember that this is so because it is narrated from the perspective of the Cabal. It is the winner who writes the stories, but they differ from reality. I have always been the bad one, instigator of the masses, the problematic one. But it is up to everyone individually what to see and what to believe. I only know that deep within me there is a will to fight and never give up, not even in death. Returning as a bad herb to protect those who cannot defend themselves. I just know that something moves me and I continue. I continue to instigate masses. I continue being the problematic one. I lift people to fight, but with tactics and defense. But yes, to defend yourself. What I told you about Arsinoe is the light version to be published, because I could go into nauseating detail but it would be impossible for people to understand how it is that I know so many details. We could spend months just on videos of Arsinoe. It is a huge subject and what I said there in what I wrote today, it is only a small part of it.